Congratulations on the film. It must be, uh, it's been a, a, a bit of a ride, I guess, since uh, TIFF, and now it's finally coming out in January. How are you feeling these days? Um, <laughs> a little bit tired, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, the kind of perils of uh, independent, well, not independent, but low-budget filmmaking in Canada. It's, you don't really have time to stand around and admire your handiwork before you need to start working on the next one. That's right, I guess. So are you in the midst of something else right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm actually uh, I'm kind of writing a pilot for uh, Resolution Pictures um, here in Montreal, and I'm just um, I'm working on another feature, another feature screenplay. Oh, cool. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that's sort of true of, of most of, I guess, Canadian show business and things. You always have to keep moving, otherwise, you know, things pass you by. Yeah. I guess that's it. Um, now, I read a, a really interesting article I found about some of your uh, influences uh, when you talk about, in this article, about uh, um, how they sort of relate to the film Rhymes for Young Ghouls. And I just wanted to pass a, a, a few of these past you and, and just get your thoughts on them. Um, Two of your favorite comic book heroes, Batman and Conan the Barbarian, um, and you sort of you you tied this back into the film uh, in a way that I thought was interesting. Can you can you explain to me how they might relate or how they may have influenced the movie? Um, well, they're both antiheroes, uh, and depending on which Conan or Batman you're talking about, the cinematic one or the the comic one, or the 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 one that's in written word. Right, right. <laughs> They're all they're all kind of different canons, but they share uh, this idea of of, of uh, not being uh, above uh, physical violence in order to kind of rectify a situation. Uh, they both lost their parents. They're both kind of vigilantes, uh, uh, particularly with uh, Conan. We we kind of follow the 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 storyline of the first movie with uh, Schwarzenegger and that, you know, this kind of religious cult comes along and destroys his family and then he kind of goes out searching for them and then kind of destroys the cult. And that's more or less the model that we, we use for for rhymes. I mean, albeit very loosely, kind of like, uh, you know, the way Scorsese says he used uh, the searchers for taxi driver. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, pretty broad strokes and you, you, you kind of got to see it. Or you you kind of got to have it pointed out to you to, to see it. Well, I, do you consider yourself a, a child of popular culture? Because I, I look at, at some of these influences and I see um, a wide variety of things. Everything from uh, you know the, the Conan and, and Batman uh, to Scott Hampton's The Upturned Stone to Dashiell Hammett to uh, Chuck Palahniuk's Fight Club, uh, and then there's a, a category called Res Life. Do you consider yourself a product of the popular culture that you received via comic books and books and television and movies? Um, um, and and is that just sort of you know all kind of floating around in your head, waiting to be formed and and repurposed into something else? No, oh, for sure. I mean, you 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 kind of just answered the the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up uh, kind of being saturated in in everything, right? Like comic books, books. Uh, I remember my stepmom was going to university at the time, so she was bringing home all these these really great like English poetry books like the T.S. Eliot's and the kind of Robert Frost. So I, I really began to appreciate art at a very early age. And it's it's kind of a weird, uh, it's, it's kind of a weird situation to be in on a reserve because there there isn't necessarily, uh, there's an appreciation for art, but not necessarily uh, in the sense that you see in, in most Western culture where really good artists are, are veered and, and a lot of kinds like totally lionized and almost made like these mythical godlike figures. You don't see a lot of that in in our culture. So that kind of rubbed off on me where I, I became like enamored by uh, the Dalis and the Picassos and, and like the kind of really high art of uh, the turn of last century. That's that's when I really when I was fascinated with that that time period from like uh, anywhere from like the early or the late 1800s to the early early 1900s, and I, I think that's where Dashiell Hammett comes in too because that that hard boiled style. Like one of my favorite books is Red Harvest, which is a, another huge influence on the film. And uh, Red Harvest, of course, I mean uh, 
cinematically, it kind of got turned into Yojimbo, which kind of got turned into A Fistful of Dollars, which right. kind of got turned into uh, <laughs> the the Coen Brothers, uh, right. the Coen Brothers. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of that movie. Uh, the Coen Brothers uh, Yojimbo. Uh, oh, not True Grit. No. Uh, no, the one with the gangsters with oh, the Gabriel Byrne. Yeah, Miller's, Miller's Crossing. Crossing. So you, you you find all that stuff, and it's it's all about this kind of one protagonist, usually a, a man in this in this case. But for us, we we thought it would be better if it were a woman. But you 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 kind of get this guy up against all the the gangsters and the hoodlums, and you know just being able to outsmart them all and and bring them all to their knees. So like that that story or that type of story was always kicking around in my head. So it it you know makes perfect sense that it was the first one. That I ever wanted to put the screen, right? And it's weird too because it goes through all these filters, and by the time it hits the screen, what you're trying to emulate is turned into something completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I imagine that this is something that you've been thinking about for a very long time, you know. And so I guess those filters just come with time as well, you know. Ideas morph and change a little bit, you know, the yeah. further they get away from the source, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now, uh, you changed, you know, as you just said, uh, you know, typically in those stories it would have been a, a male protagonist. You have uh, a young woman here, Devery Jacobs, uh, is the actress. Tell me a little bit about writing for a female uh, voice in this story. Um, well, that's the main reason that I had done it, because prior to this, I, like, uh, I didn't really flesh out my female characters, and it was... It was you know, it was it was becoming a point of contention for me because I, you know, fancy myself a writer. So, you know, how how good of a writer could I be if I couldn't write for like fifty percent of the population? That's insane. <laughs> so I decided to kind of start with just this writing exercise when uh when we sat down and all right, what do you want to do next? Was the question, and I was like, all right, I don't I don't know, but I know I want the lead to be a woman. I want it to be told from a female perspective. And it, it just kind of it, it kind of took off from there. And I didn't really try to write from a woman's perspective per se. I just thought of certain character traits that I wanted to to embody. And from that point on, it was just kind of a, a decision making process from whatever situation that I put her in. All right, what what would my Ayla do here? You know, given you know her history and given her attitude. It, it became almost colored by numbers because she could be, she became such a such an entity, such a real person for me so quick that it became a matter of just putting her in situations and knowing how she she was going to react to them. Right. Douglas Copeland told me that that he feels that way with his characters. He feels like they're they're living little lives in his head. And all he has to do is sort of put them somewhere, and then they they tell him what to do. Almost. Exactly. I mean, it's almost to the point where they're they're living without you. Right. Like they're 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 like continuing on without you know without your having to. I think that's why the film too is so open ended because it just seems like her story isn't done there. It's right. just. You know, we ran out of money to keep filming it, so <laughs> we had to let it go. <laughs> Could you see revisiting her and coming back oh, in yeah, a few for, years? Yeah, for, for sure, for sure. Well, I, I tell everybody who's, who's asked about this world, and it's like, well, all these characters exist outside of this story. Like, uh, there's the, the the young mechanic in the story actually plays a a different role in a, another movie I did called The Colony. Mm -hmm. yes, in that. Knows, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it takes place like a few years, like ten years later, where he lives in the city, and you know, so he, he his world was already established well before uh, rhymes. And there's another character that are, reoccurs in another screenplay, the the old man. So it's it's like it's all part of the same world, the same kind of fictional fictional universe. I you know create created in my head for all these characters to to kind of coexist.
that's very much like uh, Tarantino. You know, all his characters of throughout all the movies the more movies he makes the more straight lines are being drawn between the characters and and uh, uh i read an interview with him recently talking about uh, vince vega and you know how he's related to some of the other characters in some of the other movies and it's this whole tarantino universe that he is yeah you hear your name pop up in reservoir dogs yeah yeah it's uh, supposed to be the the vega character vic, vic vega right. supposed to be the brother That's so right. Yeah, you, you see instances of this and in, in so many other filmmakers and, and storytellers' canons where it's it's like, a, or you could take the Star Wars canon, for instance. I mean, it, it turns into something else where everybody starts contributing and it becomes a universe that, you know, you literally have hundreds of people in. That's not what I'm saying, why we universes, but I think, you know, all these things always start from that, that one place where it's like, all right, it's it's this world, and now we can just kind of keep adding to it. Right, right, right. Yeah, in 10 years, there might be hundreds of people in it. Yeah. If you keep going at this rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, tell me uh, where did the title came from. It's, I, I, as I understand, it's uh, from a poem that you had read at one point in your life? It's uh, from a book of poems called uh, Rhymes for Young Ghouls. It's actually a, a book of uh, kind of like these ghastly Halloween poems. <laughs> and uh, I remember finding this this book in uh, this old secondhand bookstore in the middle of Maine, like in the middle of the sticks in Maine, right. called The Chicken Burn. <laughs> and I, uh, it was around, around the time that I was writing the, the screenplay, and uh, I remember thinking to myself, wow, that would be such a... A great uh, that would be such a great title for a, a movie. And it kind of started from there. And there's a scene uh, where I lifted a, a poem called "Vespers" right. from uh, Ed McBain, an Ed McBain book. I forget which one it is. The one with the priest killers, anyway. And it talks about this rhyme that these priests used to remember to uh, to remember the, the the vespers, the vespers prayer. So that was actually a part of the uh, a part of the the film for a while. You see bits and pieces of it left in there, where uh, the kid, the young popper, smashes the the uh, the young Joseph in the back of the head, and he he says something like, uh, "And vespers was the evening prayer, or something like that." Anyway, he, he recites the whole thing, and it's supposed to be this idea of tying in like all of the the imagery of the dead kids and the rhymes, and this idea of they're all interconnected and they're all kind of a part of one another and it's it's all it's all interrelated right but then you know we ended up cutting that scene so the <laughs> rhyme is kind of the, the, the title is almost nonsensical at this point. <laughs> but well, there was a reason for it yeah well it'll it'll uh, it'll turn up on the dvd extras maybe yeah well that's uh that's it i mean what what does speaking of tarantino what does the reservoir dogs mean yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm sure he has a, a reason. I've never been able to figure it out. <laughs> um, Debbie Jacobs, in an interview that I saw with her, says that she hopes this movie shocks the hell out of people. Do you share that with her? Um, uh, not, not quite. In, I don't know. When you put it like that, it kind of sounds like uh, we're we're making uh, some kind of sh shocking. really provocative. Yeah. And I suppose that is, but I, I think the idea behind what we were doing was uh, to kind of show the enormity of what, you know, what actually went on. And the weird thing is, it's it's kind of like, uh, it's it's you, you do want to shock people, but not with the content of the film, but with the idea that the content of the film actually happened, right. I think. That's what people are, are kind of losing. We've gotten, like, most of the reviews have been, you know, astoundingly positive. Yeah. But the, the couple of bad ones that we got have, have complained about the popper role and how over the top it is and how kind of he, he, he's like this mustache twisting villain. And it's just like, if you know the history, I mean, these guys had to have existed. And there was no, I mean, I suppose you could be polite about saying, like, all right, you can't leave the reserve and you can't go get work and you have to live in this poverty. And by the way, can you give us your kids? I'm sure there's a polite Indian agent yeah. slash to an officer somewhere that, <laughs> that was really cool about it. But at the end of the day, I mean, these were the acts of evil men. Yeah, of mad men. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like, how do you present that in a way that's, uh, 
I don't know, conducive to characterization or, or whatever stupid thing you want to kind of throw at the, the his character. I mean, I just wanted him to be bad because what he represented was evil. So uh, I think that there's there is in some way kind of a universality to the story too. I mean, oh yeah, you know, for people sure. living in you know 1942 in Germany, you know, will see echoes of of you know their lives in there. I mean, uh, all I actually the think that's why Berlin didn't program it. Do you think so? Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually because there's a scene where you know she goes out into the woods and she she sees what she sees and I mean there's only one other. Well, there's tons of instances of, you know, mass graves, but there's only one that you you can really think of when you see the, those images, and that's, exactly. that's you know the, the Holocaust and what went on at the internment camps. That's interesting. I hadn't really uh, I hadn't pieced. That well, together. Berlin has a they have a native envelope. They have like a native like programming sector there, where it's just like they show na native films from all over the world, and you know if you look at some of the other things they've programmed, I mean it's not like they're they have like a super high standard for <laughs> what they program over there. So it's like if it's if it has native content and it's done by a native director, they have a tendency to really treat it with uh, you know with with a lot of respect. Because with some reverence. Really weird fascination with native culture over there. I mean, uh, there's a, another documentary called um, uh, Jesus. Why can't I remember? Anyway, there's a scene in there where. This, this guy goes to Germany and there's like these little kind of camps of these crazy Germans acting like Indians and, and like speaking Mohawk and it's 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 kind of it's kind of disconcerting. And, and this See, is a documentary. This is real life. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, there's wow. there's there's tons of instances of of people going over there and seeing these like tribes and clans. There's a um, there was like this huge fascination with the American West in Europe for a while, particularly like the Eastern Europe, right? And and Germany used to write all these kind of uh, uh, these Western novels with with like uh, Pocahontas type women being rescued, and it, it's 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 like a whole thing going back almost a hundred years. So there's like, I guess yeah. it explains Grey Owl to a certain extent. I mean, he was English, but still. Uh, you know the man who came over here and lived uh, under a different name. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, there's there's just like a huge fascination with, with native culture over there. And the other thing too is that it has a tendency to be uh, a kind of fascination with the drum and feather Indian, and they're not really interested in the modern Indian. That's actually true of a lot of places. I mean, uh, not so much in Canada because I think you know the native. Uh, Kind of uh, the native social movements here are a little bit more vocal than they are anywhere else. But if you look in the stuff you see in the states, it's uh, it's kind of retrograding to who we were, not who we are, right. and how it reflects on us today, rather than you know this is this is who we are right now. There are no drums and feathers. We don't ride bareback on horses anymore, and you know there's real social issues here. Well, maybe that's a way of of not dealing with the social issues. You know, is to oh, yeah, is sure. not to confront the modern day reality. For sure, it is. I actually think that's part of the reason why the the film didn't get nominated at CSA is too. Outside of Devery's performance, I think right. it has a lot to do with the politics of the film and people just not knowing how to react to them. Right. Well, but the the, the reaction. I mean, uh, you know, I saw it at the the Toronto Film Festival. And I watched it again last week, and I remember at the film festival, people were talking about it in a very positive way. Yes. So, you know, and, and that's got to be gratifying on some level. I mean, you know, screw the, the Canadian Film Awards or whatever, the, the Canadian Screen Awards and all this stuff. It, it's got to be, that's got to be gratifying for you to, to have a film uh, play there and actually make, you know, to to uh, make some noise above the 365 or whatever uh, other number of films that were playing there that year. Oh, that had a lot to do with uh, Cameron Bailey, I think, and you know he he's probably the most prominent film critic in Canada, and I think when you hear him, you know, talk about a film, particularly as much as he promoted rhymes, I think it's 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 you know it's kind of like a praise from Caesar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's uh, it's it's really a cinephile's film, you know what I mean? Because there's so many. There's so much kind of camera masturbation, and there's so much like <laughs> reference to other other films, and there's so many uh, little kind of geek 
Easter eggs in there, I, yeah. I think it makes for fun viewing for somebody who's a, a kind of cinephile. Right. I think the, the the feeling I felt the most was relief. It was I was relieved. I wasn't I didn't feel gratified because uh, I just felt like it was such a group effort that it didn't feel like it was just it was just me. And I, I just felt relieved that these guys who took like gigantic pay cuts to work on a film did it for what we're getting now, which is the recognition of the story. Right. And people actually putting bums in seats, people actually seeing it. I mean, there's no point in making a movie if nobody sees it. Well, that's it. I mean, this is uh, what we were talking about last week during the, the top ten. Uh, and that's, you know, people were complaining. There's almost a sense of uh, entitlement because it's public funding that, all right, if if we have a story to tell, you have to give us money because, you know, we're Canadian and we deserve it. And, right. It's like at the end of the day, well, your film has to be good still, <laughs> and it still has to make money because it's it's like everybody treats it like a gigantic tax write-off or something like right. it's great one great big welfare system. But at the end of the day, I think Canadian cinema still has to make waves in the world, and I think that's you know that's that's kind of the case in Quebec where a lot of the Quebec filmmakers have traditionally made you know top ten lists and you know. Yeah. We got a couple of Oscar nods this year, or did we? Yeah, well, yeah, Enemies did, Denny Yeah, Denis film did, and, uh, the and this, I think Dallas Buyers Club, right? Yeah, for Dallas Buyers Club, I think, who's uh, who I think is uh, from Quebec, so yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and you, you look at the animation coming out of Quebec, too, with right. uh, the NFB. Yeah. And it's it's uh, one of the reactions that we're getting is that everybody's so happy to see a Canadian film with so much attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it, listen. It's an in-your-face movie, and it's one that once you see it, uh, you can't forget it. I can't get the image of her sitting with the gas mask on uh, out of my head in, in the smoky, you know, in the drug den. Yeah. It's yeah. unbelievable. Like it's 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 that is an image that when I walked away from it the first time, stayed with me and stayed with me. It's just such a, uh, it's just so bizarre for one thing, but it's so cool and it's so. I guess it's in your face. It's the attitude. It's in your face. It's it, it it says something about the point of view of this movie. It's interesting that nobody actually like out of all the questions that we we got, it was never like why is she wearing a gas mask? Or <laughs> well, why? so she doesn't get high, right? That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that, yeah. That's it. I mean, I just thought that was going to be one of the things that was going to get lost in translation. Like, right. why is she just wearing it to be cool? Or <laughs> because you see her wearing it too while she's spray painting, and then you don't really that's question right. as much. But then she's wearing it again when she's like. Uh, Rolling the joints and yeah. and the party and you see the smoke everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I, I I liked it a lot. It was it was uh it was this thing that I had been using forever. I had used a gas mask in one of my student films like six seven years ago. So I was kind of trying to figure out a way to integrate it into the into filming something modern, but you know in a way that didn't seem like it was uh tacked on right crazy right. well for me it made sense i just like to say it's like a secondhand smoke issue like you don't want to you know if someone yeah. the, the person with the money can't be getting high you know is what i is what it you know made me think so <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't, can't get high off your own supply yeah, and exactly. it was just this idea that she wanted to separate herself from True. like the yeah. drug addicts and the the drunks and you see her that was uh one of the things that we're, we're getting a lot of kind of uh criticism in terms of uh, you know you're 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 kind of showing natives in a disparaging light in a negative light and I was like well if you look at the fucking lead character man I mean yeah. she doesn't drink or smoke or right. you know she makes a bunch of morally reprehensible decisions but in terms of engaging in any of that drug or alcohol abuse she doesn't do that do you think that people can they just see what they want to see or something sometimes you know when because i didn't take that away from the movie i took it as a it's a you know for me it's a it's a crime drama it's a personal story with a very strong female character in the lead and um i'm not sure that i i thought that it disparaged anybody i think it's it's the history of, of cinema and i think it's true of any minority director or any kind of minority story in that you don't want to reinforce these ideas that have been sitting around for a hundred years, right? right? Like Native people are a bunch of dog-eating child, you know, child rapists yes. or black people, all they do is steal. I mean, like any of that, right. I think it's hard 
for a minority director to tell those stories in terms of just trying to get the freedom of, of being able to characterize whoever's in his story any way he wants without worrying about, you know, if, if he's going to bring down an entire race of people. <laughs> but I think that's a legitimate, a legitimate beef. Yeah. And you look at movies like uh, Boys in the Hood, I mean... When it came out, it was like this watershed film. But if you look back at it, I think it's about 25 years old now. If you, if you look back on it, it was kind of melodramatic and a little cheesy. And I think that's because you're starting to see the first waves of these stories come out. And then you see Menace to Society a few years later. And you start seeing like the street smarts. And you start seeing the attitude of 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 the, you know protagonists without any of the drama and they're not very nice people and then you flash forward to something like The Wire and you see just downright evil men and they're black and it, nobody cares it's just who they are and it's it's indicative of the, the space and I think you know native cinema is yet to kind of go through that metamorphosis where you're depicting the characters the way they're supposed to be depicted without any kind of uh, like if the bad guy does something bad he doesn't get killed in the next scene right. it's just it's just this, these people exist in our society and nine times out of ten there is no rep there is no uh payback or, or for anything that they do i mean they might end up in prison or something like that but you know nine times out of ten these guys just exist out there and they exist in you know white form red form black form yellow form it's just they're gangsters they're there <laughs> they're going to be there but i think like i said because you're a minority there's that uh, you know apprehension of depicting any any horrible character traits in these in these people because that's really been their role for the past hundred years and and i just didn't even care i didn't even approach it i don't give a shit what yeah. anybody thinks about native people a hundred years prior to my making this film so I think, I, I know we rubbed people the wrong way. I, I know we did because uh, if you look at something like Imaginative, uh, everybody thought the film was going to be a shoo-in for best director, but the, the jury felt like it depicted natives in a negative light, so they didn't give us any awards. And I had somebody tell me about it later, and I was like, fuck, seriously? Because I've been dealing with this for about 10 years now with every film that I make and, and that you want to make the movie you want to make but at the same time you're dealing with all these kind of peripheral politics that have nothing to do with what you're trying to say I well not not directly anyway yeah i don't i mean i i don't think that you have to concern yourself with that i mean i don't know maybe you do i it, it's hard for me to say really but i don't think you know martin scorsese uh or the you know uh, david uh whatever his name was that created the sopranos david chase david chase uh you know bowed down to italian groups who said listen you can't you can't portray us like this which happened in the case of the sopranos yeah but you see them and, you see them address it right do you see like these these kind of affluent almost wasp Mm -hmm. <laughs> they refer to them as wonder wonder bread wops in the <laughs> panels right you 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 see them address it within the context of the show right it's like oh we're we're not you know gangsters and we're positive images for native people and when they do it it's kind of the, the more lamer episodes and it's just like why are you explaining any of this like the worst episode absolute worst episode of the sopranos was the one where um they decided to fight or fight back against the guys protesting Columbus Day. Right, and it was yeah, the, yeah. The, the native people. And it was just a horrible episode. And it's like, why would you drag all this race and politics into it? I mean, like, especially somebody like Columbus, who was like a slave, yeah, yeah. a slave trading pederast. Like, why do you, why would you try to defend something like that? It's, it's, it's awful. So it's, it's kind of, you start seeing these sentiments, right, of trying to protect your culture, but it looks so contrive that it doesn't work right. so I, I like I, I just don't even address it I, I try not to anyway I just try to create these these worlds and these characters in an interesting cinematic way that just so happens to be a Mi'kmaq